Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAS YouTube channel. And this is part of the good stuff. This is the AAS Journal author series. And I'm super happy to have Barbara Cohen with us today. Hi, Barbara. Hi, how are you? I am doing wonderful on this May 5th or April 5th, <laughs> uh, 2022. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's first contact day. It is. <laughs> it's the day we made first contact in Star Trek, or so I'm given to understand from my awesome. Trek. Friend. Very cool. Very cool. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, Barbara, where are you located at? I am in Laurel, Maryland. Cool. It's about halfway between DC and Baltimore. Uh, and I live here because I work at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. Very cool. Uh, and aside from being a Star Trek fan, I take it, you also have uh, some paintings there and a rock collection and you have all kinds of stuff there. I, you know, it's surprising. I'm not a Star I'm not a Star Trek fan. I'm not a, a science fiction fan, which is maybe a little surprising. Uh, but I am a rock fan, so I do have my rock collection behind me. So those are all rocks that I have personally picked up or like in some cases I've even created. So like, here's the one that I created myself out of lava. Ooh, that is awesome. Where did the, where did the lava come from? This is from Hawaii. So I went into Hawaii and dipped my rock hammer and made a rock hammer. Wow, there you go. That is very nice. Real lava, very cool. Very, very good. I dare to ask you, Barbara, what do you like to do for research? <laughs> <laughs> so I like rocks. <laughs> I, I like rocks. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I like rocks from other planets. So I like rocks from the moon and Mars and asteroids. They come to us as meteorites. And I like to take them apart in the laboratory and learn what they're made out of and uh, do a de little detective work to figure out how old they are. So that's my guiding science passion is, is how old rocks are, what they're made out of, and what that can tell us about the history of a planet. So we use the age of the rocks to, to put that history in order. So when you find a rock like this, like a lava rock, you can say, okay, that tells me that there was a volcano. In this case, I saw the volcano, so I know that there was a volcano. But if you didn't, if you weren't there to see it, you'd be like, okay, there's a volcano. <laughs> Um, but you want to know when was the volcano compared to when the sand dunes were compared to when the oceans were and that's what the ages of the rocks tell us. That one's a young rock. It's a very young rock. Very young rock. <laughs> last came together. And that is going to bring us to this super awesome Planetary Science Journal article. It's open access people, you can go get it. In situ geochronology for the next decade, mission designs for the moon, Mars, and Vesta. And Barbara, take us away. Uh, where this is the culmination of uh, a lot of work that we did. You can tell by how long the, the paper is. Uh, we had uh, a team of people that you can see here, amazing team of scientists and engineers who came together for uh, a little more than a year and worked on some mission concepts that we could give to the Planetary Science Decadal Survey. Now that's coming out in a couple of weeks. And so we'll see if they took any of this information and incorporated it. We did get to brief the Decadal Survey a couple of times so they were aware of the work. But what we wanted to give the Decadal Survey was uh, an idea of what it would take to get the ages of rocks on other planets in situ, meaning take our laboratory with us. That's the approach we've taken for Mars exploration, right, with curiosity and perseverance, we take the laboratory with us. Um, so instead of waiting for samples to come to me, I want to get the ages now, now, now. And so I want to go to those planets and get the ages of their rocks. Um, so that's we wanted to uh, explore that option and see what it would really take because it's a brand new measurement. We've never done this. No one's ever done it on another planet. So we wanted to see what it would take to do it. Oh, cool. Very nice. Geo. Yeah. So like the reason we want to do this, um, if you want to scroll down to figure one. Figure one. Let's take a look at figure one. Okay. Let's blow that up a little bit. Too much. Yeah. So like, what we're looking at here is um, across the top, you've got um, time, right? So our solar system is about four and a half billion years old. We're way down here at zero right now. My little rock here is at zero uh, on this scale. 
And uh, here's the inner, inner planet, so the terrestrial planet, so Mercury, Earth, Moon, Vesta, and Mars, um, all inner planets, terrestrial planets, rocky planets. So we think, right, these formed out of the early solar system, gas and dust swirling around, protoplanets forming, planetesimals forming, um, and then things go whizzing around and make giant impacts, and then we get the planets that we see today. And then they sort of evolve over time. Um, they have internal heat engines, so they have volcanism, they have surface exposure, some of them have atmospheres. Um, so they're, they're doing, doing their thing. Mm -hmm. Things like giant impacts and water being delivered and things like that, that is more of a solar system process. Mm -hmm. So when we think about asteroids coming in and hitting the earth, they're also hitting the moon, they're also hitting Mercury and Venus and Mars. Um, when we think about water being delivered or the way planets lose heat, that should be pretty well governed across the inner solar system. But when we look at the time scale, so the bars on top tell us how we split up a planet's history. And when we split up a planet's history, we do that based on what we understand about big geologic processes happening, big time scale differences on, on, on planets. So like in our case, in the case of the Earth, right, we've got times when oxygen became really prevalent or uh, you know things really changed on the earth in a big geologic way. And so that's what it is for the other planets as well. But you can see none of them line up, not a single one of them. So that doesn't help us understand what was happening across the whole solar system, what was happening in common with those planets. Uh -huh. That's what I wanna get to. But uh -huh. the weird thing about this time scale is we only know those numbers for the earth and the moon. The rest of those we're just inferring based on crater counts. So when you look at cratered surface, yeah. when you look at the crater counts, something that's been out for a longer time has more craters on it. Something that's been out for less time has less craters on it. So you can say that one is older than the other, but we don't have the exact numbers for how old they are. And that's what I wanna get to. And I wanna, maybe not make these line up, but understand what was happening in the solar system to cause them to look like they do. Good, cool. I'm with you. So if we want to do that and we want to make a mission that goes to the moon or Mars or Vesta, like to get some of these ages, that's what the paper is about, is what kind of architecture do we need? What kind of instrument? What kind of precision does it need? Where would you go to do this? Like, what kind of terrain would you pick? How would you actually land them there? What, would, what does the spacecraft look like? And then crucially to the Decatur survey, how much would it cost? So that's, <laughs> what the, that's what the rest of the paper is. And if you want to go all the way to the punchline, all the way at the end, the last figure is actually a, a table Oops. that gives you, you know, what would it take to really do this? World shortest 33 page paper. <laughs> Punchline. Get the rest. Go right to this figure. <laughs> this is sort of the, the punchline for the missions. So we have uh, uh, two different instruments doing in situ geochronology, a whole host of other instruments that help you make sense of those measurements, help you give you context, help you interpret what those ages mean. Um, that would be the full payload. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you'd want to do that at multiple sites. So we tried to look at the way you'd get mobility if you had a rover or a hopper or multiple landers, how you get multiple sites. So those are the things that we measured against. So you could get your full payload, but only on a single lander to the moon under New Frontiers. New Frontiers is the planetary science mission category that's about $750 million or uh, less than a billion all in with all your everything in there. So a billion dollar mission. Okay. Um, that's our biggest PI led or principal investigator led mission class. Okay. So we were trying to see if you could get something in that class. And for the moon, you can with one lander, or maybe you can shrink down the payload, get a reduced payload, okay. maybe not as much measurement, but you could take a hopper and you could go to multiple sites. So you could do your full payload to one site or a reduced payload to multiple sites um, for that same amount of money. And same, similarly for Mars, but for Vesta, it's cool because Vesta doesn't have very much gravity. So you could take that full payload and you can hop around Vesta 
<laughs> for a new frontiers mission. That would be pretty cool. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Very good. So that's what we propose to the decadal survey is um, if you like this science, if you think this science is important, then we really want you to take this very seriously and say, let's do a mission. The thing about New Frontiers missions in planetary science is you can't just propose them whenever you want. There's a competition and a competition is every five years or twice a decade. Those are our chances to propose something like this. But furthermore, you can't propose anything you want. You can only propose against the list that's in the decadal survey. So you've got to convince the decadal survey to put your mission in, oh, oh, oh. wait for the decadal survey to come out, oh. <laughs> and then propose against it. And I've been working on in-situ geochronology as a technique and as a science impetus uh, for a long time now, and it hasn't been in the decadal survey. And so proposing a mission was difficult. And I remember pretty clearly uh, several years ago trying to propose a mission and people telling me, well, it's, we don't want to back this because it's not in the decadal survey. And I said to myself, you know what I need to do? And my friend said, what, you know, propose it again? And I said, no, I need to change the decadal survey. That's where the action is. So that's what this, this paper was all about and this study was all about. Let's get it into the decadal survey and uh, make sure that we all agree that it's an important thing to do so that we can propose it. Mm -hmm. uh, since you mentioned a cost class for New Frontiers, what's the cost class for flagship? Bit more than that. <laughs> more than a billion. <laughs> so it's just that's the dividing line. Yeah, exactly. So typically a flagship runs about two and a half billion, but those you can't propose. Those aren't uh, a PI led mission. That's something that NASA would take on strategically, that they would say NASA wants to do this. So that's something like more sample return. Um, so yeah, that's probably not something that's going to happen for us. Okay. But it's good to have it on there. Yeah. Uh, you know, again, uh, it's uh, giving us the uh, trade space, what's what's possible to happen. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Very cool. Uh, yeah. Did you want to walk through any particular parts of uh, somewhere between figure one and figure 23? <laughs> <laughs> the, 30 pages, the 30 pages in between. Yeah, sure. Let's talk about uh, some of the uh, cool places that uh, we, we might want to go and, and what the instruments are that allow you to do in situ geochronology. Yeah. So um, let's go up to, um, honestly, I can't remember which is first. So we'll just find let's it. Let's look at some places and some instruments. Okay, places and instruments. We have summary of the goals in table one. We have landing sites in table two. <laughs> Impact yeah, melt. Let's keep going. Objective. Wow, there's a lot of words here. You should go there's read A lot them. of words, there's some pretty good, good words. words. <laughs> okay, so here's a, here's some good examples. Okay, I, I had an amazing team helping with this, and this is some of the work that they did, where uh, we wanted to show uh, that you could do good science, but you could do it in a place that was safe to land. So you can't land just anywhere on these planets. You have to land somewhere where your lander is going to survive the landing, right? And so um, we wanted to show places that were safe. But also you don't want to just go to a safe place that's not scientifically relevant. So you have to sort of convolve those two things. Mm -hmm. It turns out this is for the moon. Um, and for the moon, some of the places that we want to go that are high priority science are places that are big impact craters, big basins. Well, that's true on, in every case. We want to go to these big impact basins that were um, melted and recrystallized, and that gives us the age of these giant basins. And that tells us whether there was bombardment throughout the whole solar system, whether that was happening on all the different planets at the same time, which we think should be true, but we don't know whether it's true. So it's a test of, of that hypothesis. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So to do that, you have to go to these big craters, but a lot of these big craters uh, have been filled in by lava flows. That's the mare that you see on the moon. So when you go out and look at the moon at night and you see these big black splotches, that's lava that's filled in these giant craters. So we have to find these little places where maybe later craters have punched through and excavated that material out from under the basalt for us. Mm -hmm. So here's one Pierce crater that uh, is a really cool place to go look. There's a couple of other ones that we identified in this study and other people are now doing follow-up geology on those. But this was super fun to try to compare 
uh, the science goals with the landing site safety goals. So we have a couple examples in here on the moon, um, on Mars and on Vesta where the Dawn mission orbited and gave us some great close up views of Vesta. So we're really lucky that we have these data sets to work with and can find those good intersections of science and safety. Cool. Very so cool. yeah, you can see those. Uh, we've got a couple moon ones. We've got some Mars one and Vesta ones as we scroll through. Yeah, there's another one um, for actually for Pierce Crater itself. So slopes and roughness. Rossi Crater. Rossi Crater, yeah, exactly. This is something that uh, that would be a really great one to do as well. Um, that's in Nectaris Basin on the moon. So that's one of the oldest basins on the moon that we think um, still exists and still is visible. That would be a really nice one to date. All right, so we got landing sites, potential yeah. sites chosen. Potential landing sites, and it, it was really just a proof of concept to show that there's lots of great landing sites. Yeah. Um, landing sites to look at, Young Basalts, that's another one that we would like to do and see when heat engines um, finished, when, when they were done on the moon and Mars. So there's uh, more Young Basalts. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, and then I think we've got, um, yeah, lots of lunar data. Oh man, this really showcases the, the lunar reconnaissance orbiter data. Wow, it's it's an amazing data set. Go um, Elrod. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so then I think we've got, yeah, we've got Mars in here. So uh, this would be a super cool place. So you can get a little bit of a sense of elevation here on the left-hand side, it's it's high up and very heavily cratered. And on the right-hand side, it's lower down and less heavily cratered. And there's there's two units here is in like a little chasm. Like it's hard to really get a feel for this, but if you were standing between those two dots, you'd see like a big cliff rising up and layers in there. Um, and so like you could get the age of the floor you're sitting on on the right-hand side and the age of the top of those cliffs. That would be super cool. So we know like the crater counts on both of those. And if you could get absolute ages, you'd like to, you'd really nail the, the ages of Mars. That would be amazing. Very good. Yeah, it's, it's a really cool site. Uh, again, the geologic map from Mars just showing you there's there's lots of cool stuff there. And then I think the next one is, uh, yeah, there's Marth Vallis on Mars. And then on Vesta, um, just showing you the geologic map. The geologic map, you know, the details aren't what we're looking for. What we're saying is there's a whole bunch of different geologic units on Vesta. Sometimes people think, oh, it's an asteroid. You know, it's just a big pile of rubble. And some, some asteroids are that. Um, but Vesta is a complex geologic world. It is, it's a dwarf planet or would be a dwarf planet if it were rounder. Mm -hmm. um, but it definitely um, has a, a crust, a, a mantle, and probably a core. And so it acts like a planet. It acts like a small planet. And we would love to learn more about that for sure. Yeah, so how would we do this? You can keep going down to the next. Yeah, okay, so this, this is showing you the two instruments that uh, we included in the study. Both of them are in development. So on the left-hand side, um, the CDEX instrument that is um, being done by my colleague, Scott Anderson at Southwest Research Institute in Boulder. Okay. And he is making an instrument that does rubidium strontium dating um, using uh, laser resonance ionization. It's a very cool technique. Um, it, it overcomes a lot of issues with rubidium strontium dating that even we have in the laboratory. So that is a, a super nice instrument. We we're really happy to um, include it. And on the right-hand side is my instrument called CARLY, the potassium argon laser experiment. Mine is not nearly packaged up as well as Scott's. We haven't quite that's got it there. Happy. Yeah, that's the, <laughs> that's the laboratory version. It, it would come down into sort of the size. The, there's uh, the left hand side. If you put a pencil up to the side of it, it's like two pencils long. Pencil right. Long. So, yeah, mm -hmm, exactly. So it's, it's uh, yeah, nice and compact, and all the electronics and stuff are in there. Mm -hmm. um, and we think we can get Carly there. It's just not there yet, but they're pretty comfortable. <laughs> Um, we both use uh, laser ablation um, to break up the rock mm -hmm. and into its constituent uh, atoms. And each one of those atoms, we want to measure 
um, and we measure uh, radiogenic pairs. So in Scott's case, he's measuring rubidium that decays to strontium. In my case, I'm measuring potassium that decays to argon. Those radiogenic pairs tell us how old the rock is, right? So when a rock starts off, in the case of potassium argon, it's potassium, normal rock forming element. It's in your bananas, it's in your granite countertops. Uh, it's, it's a very normal rock forming element, but it decays to argon naturally over time in about a billion years, about half of the potassium atoms decay to argon atoms. So it's not significant on our lifetime. You don't super much have to worry about your granite countertops decaying away to a gas, um, but it is a technique that we can exploit to understand how old those rocks are, how long it's been since they crystallized. So we both have to measure a parent and a daughter and we have to measure the ratio of those and that tells us how long that rock has been around um, and there's how old it is. So we have two different complementary techniques. Um, if a rock crystallized, like my nice lava rock back here, lava rock, yep. <laughs> the instant it crystallizes, those two numbers should be the same. It should be all rubidium and all potassium, no strontium and no argon. And then over time, those will both decay and they should give you the same answer. Mm -hmm. That would be great. If you got the same answer, and that's what we would hope for. But even if you didn't get the same answer, that also tells you something. <laughs> so it can tell you about the thermal history of the rock, or it can tell you about the later impact history of the rock. Okay. So having those two techniques makes it a really robust option nice. um, and gives us some confidence in what we're doing. Nice. But these instruments just give you the uh, parent-daughter ratio of those two elements. And these are the instruments that help you understand what it is you're looking at. Mm -hmm. So I can just put, as they say, garbage in, garbage out. If I just shove a rock in and I don't know what it is, then I get an isotopic ratio and I don't know what that means. It's not an age. An age is an interpretation. It's an interpretation of an event that happened to the rock. Like it crystallized or it dissolved or it had some thermal event happen to it. Mm -hmm. So in order to understand that, we have to use these kinds of instruments, cameras, spectrometers, things that give us the elemental composition. That tells us about the rock itself. And you can you know, think about all the good space missions that we do to Mars and other places where we use these kinds of instruments, mm -hmm. learn about the rock. Oh, this rock looks like this happened to it or that happened to it. So that when you get the isotopic ratio, you can interpret the age. Does this red instrument here get a ride too? <laughs> no, TSA says you cannot bring knives on spacecraft. <laughs> oh, very good. Ooh, a back. So in order to get the rock into the instruments, the rock is sitting on the ground. Your instruments are sitting on the spacecraft. You got to get one to the other. So yeah, so this is Planet Vac, which is, oh my gosh, such a cool little device. Mm -hmm. Honeybee Robotics makes these cool devices for a lot of different planetary missions. This one uh, sits on the ground. So this is like a foot pad. Um, you can imagine it's sitting on, the, on a foot pad of a, a lander. Yeah. And it inside of here, these little valves, it's got a gas uh, blast, like a duster, right? And so it blasts gas down. And what that does is displaces regolith. So all planets um, are covered with regolith or soil to some extent. Um, and so when you set down and you blast this gas, the, the dust and the rocks come shooting back up and they can shoot up into your lander where you can then collect them and analyze them. You could also use like an arm and a scoop like Phoenix and Apollo. Yep. Um, there's a lot of different ideas out there for how to get a rock into your system. Perseverance is using a drill that would also work for us. Any of those are really good ways to get a rock to ingest it. Um, and any of those would be fine. How much rock, and, does, how much rock does one need? How much rock does one need? I'm glad you asked. Figure 17. A gram or 
<laughs> you, know, you need a kilogram. Um, no, you need rocks uh, that are about half a centimeter across. So that's that's a couple grams. It's not very much, mm -hmm. um, but you want them to be individual rocks. So we don't want them to be soil or regolith right. um, because then they're pieces of things that may or may not be related to each other and you don't know. Right. So we want the whole rock that formed together and crystallized together. And this uh, just shows you that you should not uh, fear the regolith. Sometimes we think of the regolith, especially on the moon, as uh, being very fine, um, being very dusty. And that's true. It is all those things. But there's lots of rocks in there as well. So something like Planet Back or a Scoop and Sieve, you can get rid of the fine particles and just collect the particles you need. And they exist on the moon. Um, we've got another figure later that shows they exist on Mars and Vesta too. Um, and so we just have to sort through them to find them. Okay. Good. All right. So we got there. We know where we're going. We know where we're going. We know what we know how to get the rocks. We know we've got physically got the rocks. And then... <laughs> yep, and we bring them in. And uh, the the way that we do that, you can keep scrolling down. Uh, the way that we do that is um, um, with these kinds of spacecraft. Now the spacecraft themselves are um, you know trying to carry all these instruments. Uh, to, okay, so, oh, important trade space. Mm -hmm. Trade space is a very important thing to discuss mm -hmm. for engineers. Um, so all we're trying to do here is to show that we looked at a lot of different options for the spacecraft itself. Um, when you just sit down and try to design a spacecraft from scratch, you have to give it requirements. We gave it requirements that it want, we wanted it to take this whole payload, so it's so many kilograms. We wanted it to go to a bunch of different places um, and uh, they, the engineers just have to take that and say, all right, how do we implement this? And they can do that in a lot of different ways. And as a scientist, I don't care which way, do the way that works. So we looked at a whole bunch of ways to make that uh, work. And sometimes you have a clean sheet of paper to work with. Other times, maybe you've got a ride or maybe you've got someone gave you a mirror <laughs> or something like that, right? So all of these are, are ways that you could make this these kinds of spacecraft work for us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but we picked, you know, we picked one or two just to design out and give us the, the big table at the end. And if you scroll down, I think the next figure is going to show you some of those. Yeah, there you go. So this is, uh, you know, it's not the prettiest spacecraft you can imagine. It's just a concept um, showing how we would meet their requirements. And the simplest way to do that is to put things in a box. So there's our box. There you go, there's a box. Yeah, there's a box. Now, if you put a box, right, you, you've got to get the, uh, the rocks in and out. So they're sitting out on a little platform. That's probably not what the real spacecraft would look like. There's a lot more work that you'd need to do to make sure things are shielded and you're not kicking dust up and things work thermally. But this is just to show you that it's possible and to give us kind of an envelope. That middle one for Vesta with that D and that line that's stretching all the way out, those are solar panels. Yeah, yeah, those are solar panels. That's how much solar energy you need at Vesta. It's really far away. And so uh, those solar panels, and then they would roll up and get restowed and then hop and then roll back out. That's pretty cool. And then this last one, this pink envelope, um, that is uh, a Mars lander. So that is something like the Phoenix or the InSight landers. Um, that's that same kind of deck. Um, and then inside of that pink envelope is our payload. So it would work on Moon, Mars, or Vesta. We, we got it to work on all three planets. So that was pretty great. We are not picky. <laughs> I want them all, but I will I'll take them all. Um, and then we put some real work into how we would uh, do operations and how long it would take. And that's really important because it tells you how long the mission needs to be. And how long the mission needs to be tells you how much battery power you need, how things are going to degrade over time, whether it's going to you know, be a one-off or whether it's going to be there for years and years and years. Um, so that's what this figure shows you. And it, it seems like we can do one sample per Earth day. Um, so, 
you know, that's pretty great. It means you can get everything you need done on the moon in maybe uh, one terrestrial year, I think is what we sized it for. You could probably get away with shorter if you wanted to do fewer samples. Um, but a Mars year as well. And yeah, all of these are very feasible concepts. Very nice. Payload actually. Yeah, so there's our payload. Um, yeah. You can see that it, yeah, here's a table. So it's heavy. <laughs> there's no getting around it. Our instruments are heavy. And that is because yeah. we are trying to do isotopic ratios. Yes. Um, it's yes. just a hard measurement to make in situ, and it's very nascent. So both of these instruments, the CDEX and the Carly, they are just in development now. One of the impetuses for the study is that NASA has uh, given both of these instruments development money. NASA right. has recognized that these, the community has recognized that we want to do in situ dating. They've given the teams the money to mature these instruments. But what good is that investment if we never see it fly? That investment, we want it to come to fruition by flying those and realizing their potential. But because they're nascent and we haven't had 17 generations of them, they're still pretty much on the heavy side. You have to pick up all of this other stuff. You have to pick up the sample and put it in. You have to get the context. And so all of that turns it from sort of a one instrument that you would put on a mission to its own payload. And to, to send its own payload with all of the stuff, you get up into a pretty heavy payload. My expectation is that in the next 20 years, we'll see this come down a lot in mass. I don't have 20 years left in my career. So <laughs> I'm not willing to wait. I want to see it go now because I want the answers while I'm still around. Barbara, be an optimist. You're going to be around for the next <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll be around while other people are doing this mission and I can read the results on the beach. Well, there you go. From the <laughs> end of the season, you know, fruit came. Huh? But this is very feasible to do now. It's it's heavy. That doesn't that doesn't preclude us from doing anything. It just means you have to design your payload to, to match. That's all. It's a pretty modest bandwidth. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, it's it's not uh, it's not a huge amount of data. It's all very doable and the the paper takes you through all of the feasibility for each uh, destination and the specifics for each destination are a little different, but we have a lot of experience with missions now. And so I think these are all very doable, um, especially if um, if the decadal survey sees fit to include them in the new Frontiers call. Okay, awesome. I'll pick that up in a minute. Barbara, thank you so much for walking us through your very lovely PSJ article. Very happy to do it. Super. Um, so let's play a happy game um, of, sure. of uh, what comes next over the next two to five years. Uh, and let's assume, just for fun, uh, that this actually does make it into the decadal survey. Okay. So let's assume that's true. Um, and where do we, what, what's the next steps? Where do we go from here? If it does make it into the next decadal survey, then we'll see it on a new frontiers list. And that means that uh, the next new frontiers, not the not the most, not the one that's coming up next year, the one in five years, okay. um, will be eligible to propose for it. Um, but that's not that's not a long way away in the scheme of mission proposals, right? right? So new frontiers missions, um, they're um, extensive. It's it's a lot of responsibility to be responsible for a billion dollars worth of spacecraft. Um, and so commensurately, the, the proposals are very involved. Yes. And so there's engineering that needs to get done and, and proposal writing and things like that. So hopefully, if we saw this come out of the Decadal survey, that would kick off uh, an activity for us to start thinking about how to actually do this mission. Um, starting from the concepts that you see, um, narrowing down to what we really uh, want to do and then putting some real engineering thought and design into those concepts. So that would be awesome and amazing. That, that five <laughs> years will go like that. Yeah, um, there's some really cool things on the horizon as well that NASA is doing that um, aren't 
you know, Maya science, but relate to mission architecture. So for example, for the moon, we have this uh, CLIPS program, Commercial Lunar Payload Services. And that is intended to spur this whole industry of robotic lander companies. If that really takes off, and we'll see some of those fly maybe later this year, maybe next year, but in five years, maybe we'll see several new companies offering lunar landers um, for cheap. That would be great because maybe then we could use one of those um, in our mission concept. Yeah, so you can leverage off, uh, you know, perhaps leverage off of what is uh, coming down the pipe technology-wise. And... Yep, exactly, exactly. Cool. Now the converse of your question, and I'm not I'm not going to take it to a sad place. It could still be a happy place Lazy. if it doesn't show up on the new frontiers list, which is a real possibility. Something that uh, we do um, for planetary science is we have other categories of missions. We have discovery missions, uh -huh. which right. are half a billion dollars ish. And we even have things like simplex. Um, I can't remember what simplex stands for and um, small lunar landers, the kind we just talked about too. So there are other categories of, of mission concepts that, that planetary science solicits. So it's possible that even if we don't make it on the new frontiers list, that we can take some subset of our goals, which are numerous, and our payload, which is big, and maybe slim it down and make a real targeted strike on some of these um, science goals that we want in a different mission category. It sounds like a win-win situation, although one is <laughs> probably more preferable than the other win, but. <laughs> well, I think you know, it's all good. It's, it's more of a proposed win situation. <laughs> all good. I agree. <laughs> awesome. Barbara, thank you so much uh, once again for walking us through your very lovely article. Yeah, thank you for asking me, Frank. I really appreciate the opportunity. Sure. And that'll do everyone. And I hope this makes your astronomy day just a little bit better. And we will see you on the next one. Bye-bye.